This is an excerpt from The 4-Hour Workweek by Timothy Ferris. Step 1. To use for definition. New players for a new game, global and unrestricted. C quote, Civilization had too many rules for me, so I did my best to rewrite them. Bill Cosby. As he rotated 360 degrees through the air, the deafening noise turned to silence. Dale Begg Smith executed the back flip perfectly. Skis crossed in an X over his head and landed in the record books as he slid across the finish. It was February 16, 2006, and he was now a mogul skiing gold medalist at the Turin Winter Olympics. Unlike other full-time athletes, he will never have to return to a dead-end job after his moment of glory, nor will he look back at his day as, as the climax of his only passion. After all, he was only 21 years old and drove a black Lamborghini. Born a Canadian and something of a late bloomer, Dale found his calling, an internet-based IT company, at the age of 13. Fortunately, he had a more experienced part mentor and partner to guide him, his 15-year-old brother Jason. Created to fund their dreams of staging atop the Olympic podium, it would, only two, two years later, become the third largest company of its kind in the world. While Dale's teammates were hitting their slopes for extra sessions, he was often buying sake for clients in Tokyo. In a world of work harder, not smarter, it came to pass that his coaches felt that he was spending too much time on his business and not enough time in training, despite his results. Rather than choose between his business or his dream, Dale chose to move laterally with both, from either or to both and. He wasn't spending too much time on his business, and his he and his brother were spending too much time with the Canucks. In 2002, he, they moved to the ski capital of the world, Australia, where the team was smaller, more flexible, and coached by a legend. Three short years later, he received citizenship and went head-to-head -head against former teammates and became the third Aussie in history to win winter gold. In the land of wallabies and big surf, Dale had gone has since gone postal, literally. Right next to the Elvis uh, Presley commemorative edition, you can buy stamps with his face on it. The fame, fame has, has its perks, as does looking outside the choices presented to you. There are always lateral options. New Caledonia, South Pacific Ocean. Once they say you're going to settle for second, that's what happens to you in life. Once you say you're going to settle for second, that's what happens to you in life. John F. Kennedy. Some people remain convinced that just a bit of more money will make things right. Their goals are arbitrary, moving targets. 300000 in the bank, $1 million in the portfolio, 100000 a year instead of 50000 Julie's goal made intrinsic sense, come back with the same number of children she'd left with. She reclined in her seat and glanced across the aisle past her sleeping husband, Mark, hunting as she had thousands of times before. One, two, three. So far, so good. In 12 hours, they would all be back in Paris, safe and sound. That was assuming the plane from New Caledonia held together, of course. New Caledonia? Nestled in the tropics of the Coral Sea, New Caledonia was a French territory where, she, where Julie and Mark had just sold the sailboat that took them 15,000 miles around the world. Of course, recouping their initial investment had been part of the plan. All said and done, their 15-month exploration of the globe from the gondola-rich waterways of Venice to the tribal beaches, tribal shores of Polynesia, it cost them between eighteen and nineteen thousand dollars, less than rent and baguettes in Paris. More people, most people would consider this impossible. Then again, most people don't know that more than three hundred families set sail from France each year to do the same. The trip had been a dream for almost two decades, relegated to the back of the line and behind an ever-growing list of responsibilities. Each passing moment brought a new list of reasons for putting it off. One day, Julie realized that if she didn't do it now, she would never do it. The rationalizations, legitimate or not, would just continue to add up and make it harder to convince herself that escape was possible. One year of preparation and one 30-day trial run with her husband later, they set sail on the trip of a lifetime. Julie realized that almost as soon as the anchor lifted that, lifted that far from being a reason not to travel and seek adventure, children are perhaps the best reason of all to do both. Pre-trip, her little 
where three little boys had fought like banshees at the top of the, at the drop of the hat. In the process of learning to coexist in a floating bedroom, they learned patience as much for themselves as for the sanity of their parents. Pre-trip, books were about as appealing as eating sand. Given the alternative of staring at a wall and the open open sea, all three learned to love books. Pulling them out of school for one academic year and exposing them to new environments had proven to be the best investment in their education to date. Now sitting in the plane, June looked at, out at the clouds at, as the wing cut past them, already thinking of their next plans to find a place in the mountains and ski all year long, using income from a sail rigging workshop to fund the slopes and more travel. Now that she had done it once, she had the itch.